There is nothing like a huge down opening based entirely on the stock futures to get the bullish juices going. Dow will be surging 828 points. The S&P roaring 2.6%. The Nasdaq poll voting 2.23%. I'm calling it a bull smoke show. Now, tons of smart hedge fund managers had bet that today's CPI number would cause a crash. By the way, I mean the word crash. They thought that this was October and it was over. They wanted to get out well ahead of it if they saw the CPI or even short it. Sell, sell, sell. Be- when it was down 2%. In other words, selling the futures down 2%. Now, these alleged geniuses weren't worried about a future where credit's tightening rapidly and buying a house becomes borderline impossible. They weren't betting that we'd have way too much auto inventory by this time next month, resulting in real price cuts. They weren't thinking about retail being promotional and having so much inventory. They simply made up their minds that the market was poised to be crushed by a hot inflation number, which is why they wanted out, sell out, down 2%, through the futures, because they soon figured it would be down 5%, maybe 6%. Hey, maybe it'd be down 10%. That was easy. I am not kidding. That's how they think. They were worried or opportunistic, so worried or opportunistic that they felt they could sell down 2%, betting it would be down 4, 5, 6, 7, 10%. Now, some of these bears figured they could make their whole year by being in cash, while the bums who stayed long got mauled. They made fun of you. I bumped through a couple of them. They were salivating at your expense. Funny thing, this market, it doesn't always comply with what the so-called smart money is expecting. So how do we explain today's magnificent rally? Well, first off, we came in oversold on S&P's proprietary oscillator, a little more than negative five, making it unlikely that a big sell-off would have much staying power because minus five is where almost all extreme sell-offs end, almost all of them. And I've studied that oscillator since 1987. This is the S&P's proprietary oscillator, by the way. Second, the volatility index, also known as the VIX, didn't spike when the market initially rolled over. Carl Quintanilla pointed that out to me this morning. Now, that's usually a sign that we're dealing with what I call a misdirection play. Remember, we always tell you that if the VIX goes down when the market goes down, that is but the most important tell. The best sign that this early morning pullback was a loser, I'll tell you what the best sign was. It was, it was there, and I can read it. I can smell it. I can taste it. The market didn't go lower than where the futures took it. And if you read Confessions of a Street Addict, it tells you exactly what happens when that, when that occurs. It means there will be no follow-through whatsoever, and the bears will be hung. Hung. Remember what happens when there's no follow-through. Let's say you're a bear. You end up trapped. Trapped like in one of those spring-loaded bear traps with saw teeth. Sure, the bears can howl and roar that it's all fixed. I heard them. It's all fixed. The whole thing is fixed. Or the idiot buyers don't know what they're doing. These long buyers, they're clowns. Calling you clowns, by the way. Laughing at you. But if they can't bring out more sellers with their fear, with their, they're going in the media and scaring you, if they can't, if they can't panic you, no, no. then they can only escape the trap by, ah, by ripping their legs off and then going home and, and crying to their mommies. Well, remember, they're just cubs. Now, how could the Cubs have been so wrong? Because the people who are still left in this miserable, horrible, no-good market aren't going to tr- jump stocks over something they already knew, that the consumer price index is too hot. I mean, no kidding. It's too hot. What, are like, oh, no, it's gotten cooler? Huh? What, I go to college and get stupid, stupid? Rates are going up so fast that you can't even figure out when they'll hit the consumer's collective psyche. But you know they're going to. Meanwhile, the banks will make so much money in your deposits that it's crazy for them to lend to people uh, when they can just invest that money in treasuries. Why lend? Now, wonder, no wonder the banks led the averages higher. Credit tightening is going to be brutal. It will starve marginal businesses, even legitimate ones. The combination of higher interest rates and tight credit will lead to a dramatic slowdown that will at least allow the Fed to win. I got a whole new analysis here from my dad, who was in World War II. I think they're trying to win the battle of Midway, okay? And that's the analogy I used in my investing call today, which you can go listen to at the CNBC.com website. Until the battle of Midway, the U.S. was losing everything. 
Uh, you got to listen to the call, by the way. It's got a, it, It's very cool. It's got this hilarious Karen Kramer story right at the top that's worth the price of admission to the club. Now, you won't see Midway played out in these backward-looking government statistics, although you may see it in the banks that are reporting starting tomorrow. They might say, and this is what I'm looking for, that credit's getting tight, which is exactly what the Fed wants to hear. It means they've conscripted the banks into their fight against inflation. You know what else trapped the bears? Like yesterday with PepsiCo, which was supposed to be awful, we had some big upside surprises from some highly visible companies. Look, I know Domino's DPC was one of the most powerful stocks of the last decade, but then it lost its mojo. That's a technical term for didn't do well. It's got a new CEO, though, and the numbers it reported today will bring a slew of upgrades tomorrow simply because they weren't horrible. And that's something that may spread to the rest of the industry because the QSRs, they call quick serve restaurant stocks, they tend to have a herd mentality, as do the wonderful analysts who service it. Speaking of herd mentality, last night I questioned how the heck a terrific bank like Key Corp could be so low that it yields 5%. The answer it made no sense, which is why Key was the third biggest gain in the S&P 500, no longer with a 5% yield. By the way, you could have gotten it much lower at the opening thanks to the panic sellers and the bears. Hey, maybe you need to watch Mad Money. Oh, by the way, was it so hard to find Coca-Cola either? That was what I suggested. We were like, wow, how do you think of that? Well, because it's sugar water like Pepsi? Now, a bunch of banks were going higher, including the majors, which could mean that when J.P. Morgan reports tomorrow, we might get one of those called shots where Jamie Dimon says he's buying shares because that fortress, fortress balance sheet is too enticing to ignore. I wish the stock hadn't worked five bucks today. Now it's coming in too hot, which is a recipe for weakness. But maybe people finally recognize how lucrative banking can be when the Fed tightens. We sure seem to have forgotten that the financials benefit from higher short-term rates more than anyone else in the world. We also saw real sellers remorse in tech. The semis bounced, even as they've been downgraded relentlessly. Stocks that pre-announced to the downside, like applied materials, were higher. When I gave my investing club talk, I mentioned how much I wanted to trim our semi-exposure for the charitable trust. But I couldn't let them go because of the possibility of some sort of spike up. Today, I finally felt good because we got some sort of spike up. Now, let me make one thing clear. This is one day. We've had so many bad days, so many bad news, so many negative numbers that we got oversold. We were due for a rally. They tend to be only one days. Did I know it would be today? No. But I did say that you have to stay the course because this inflation number really, was, was it really a surprise to you? Was it a surprise to anyone who was watching homes, rentals, food, wages, the only people who seemed to be stunned were the economists who were polled. I have to ask you, Mr. Econ- and Mrs. Economist, do you ever go to the supermarket? Have you ever read an apartment? Have you, are your kids trying to get a job? They'd sure be better at their job if you listened to them. Finally, let's talk PepsiCo. Yet another up 3% today, like I predicted. All these top-down geniuses never look at individual companies or what they have to say. In their eyes, companies are too small to matter. They think reading at conference school is so totally beneath them. It makes me feel like an intern at Goldman Sachs right down the block 40 years ago. But if you listen to the Pepsi call, here's what you'd know. Right now, we are at the inflection point where raw commodities are peaking. Almost every single one of them. PepsiCo went on and on to say that they can't yet take advantage of lower raw costs because they're locked into prices from nine months ago. But those lock-ins are all, they're almost over. Soon the cost of can and carboil, aluminum, and fuel will all come down. In other words, the commodity inflation headwinds are becoming tailwinds. So we're going to get some real big earnings numbers down the road. You don't need a weatherman to tell which way the wind blows, but you do want to get ahead of the change of direction. Today was a down-the-road day. We accepted that there will always be a group of people who look through the bear, uh, bear spin, uh, they look through a bearish lens, but there are also people who are bullish. The bottom line, people got too negative. But this morning, sellers, they weren't able to create enough fear. They didn't get on enough TV shows, I guess. They couldn't even get you to sell everything, even with a 100 basis point rate hike on the line. That means the remaining owners of stocks are more likely lifers, not renters, a much more reliable group of shareholders. After today, we have to remember there are always people who want to get out, but there are also still people who want to get in at the right price or never sell at all. Hey, can we go to Jeff in New York, please, Jeff? Hey, Jim, how are you? I'm good, Jeff. How are you doing? Great. Thanks for taking my call. People appreciate what you do despite the flack you get. Oh, thank you. We had a great great club call today. It was really dynamite. What's going on? 
All right, so my question is about DKNG, DraftKings, and more specifically to do with the rumored ESPN. It was rumored last year as well, and ESPN wanted um, $3 billion or something of that nature. It's rumored this time that it's uh, a lot better of a deal in favor of DraftKings, and being that it's been down so much, I know growth has hit. I kind of wanted your opinion from here. Well, I do think we have to worry about this California election. That's the problem. we got to see what happens there. But I think Jason Robbins is doing a terrific job. And I'm very much aware that partnering with DraftKings would be a very good thing for any company uh, who's in the media business because they're all doing so badly. All right. People got too negative, And you saw what happened this morning. But they weren't able to create enough fear. The bears were toothless. After today, we have to remember there are still plenty of people who never want to sell at all. Oh, man, but tonight, could a solar play like Sonova help shine some light on your portfolio? Or could the stock's recent downturn be warranted? I'm checking in with the CEO. Then there's a bull bear debate when it comes to L3 Harris. But where do I come down on the issue? They other people don't have a show. I'll give you my take. That was pure hubris. And earlier today, we held our monthly meeting for subscribers to the CBC Investing Club. And we got some amazing questions from club members. They were so amazing, I figured we'd open the floor here and get some more burning questions about the market from the investing club. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at cnbc.com or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.